Hello, and welcome to Homegrown KC, a podcast dedicated to exploring Kansas City's fascinating history and sharing stories from a church past. I'm your host, Laura. Join me today as we explore a piece of Kansas City's history. Hello, listeners. Here we are at the long-awaited adventure mini so Disney 100. Yay! I need one of those little sound machines so I can add the crowd cheering. But anyways, before we begin, a request, my faithful listeners. If you enjoy this content, please donate. Uh, had a lovely 4th of July weekend, and then Monday morning, I don't know what happened. But my garage door came down on top of my car, and now I'm facing um, some hefty repairs. So if you can give any additional donations to help support that, um, would really appreciate that. I'll give you a special shout out if you do. You can donate at redcircle.com slash homegrownkc. Instructions will be at the end. Thank you. Okay. Here we go. I'm very excited about this part. Um, If you're wondering... Why is there an exhibit of Disney artifacts at the Heartland in Kansas City? Got a little story for you. For reasons unknown, seems to be a little-known fact about the creator of Disney, Mr. Walt Disney himself, especially kind of here in Kansas City. Most folks don't seem to know that Walt lived here uh, as a kid. He grew up here and lived here as a young man. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't know that, did you? Um, Brief history. Before we go deeper at a later date, because I do really want to dive deep into this. He's born in Chicago, which ended up being the first stop on um, the American side of the store, because, of course, it's international. Um, but when he was about nine, his family moved to Kansas City. He attended Benton Elementary School. Then he later took drawing classes at the Casey Art Institute. He fought in World War One once he you know, was done with that. He came back to Kansas City, and in 1920, he started his very first company, Laughograms. And that's where he created his first character, Oswald the Rabbit, who looks suspiciously like Mickey Mouse's long-eared cousin. There's a whole story there. We're not going to go into it today. Unfortunately, the studio went belly up in 23, so then he and his brother moved to LA, and the rest, as they say, is history. So it didn't start with a mouse, it started with a rabbit. This adventure was a gift from my grandmother, thank you Nanny. She bought tickets for herself and I as an early birthday slash Christmas gift to the both of us. Um, And the exhibit opened the, uh, I want to say 25th, Memorial Weekend of May. I was like, you know what, let's give it a month, the crowds and the chaos will die down a wee bit. So we went the last weekend of June. There are 250 original drawings, costumes, character models, sheet move music. There's even Disney park rides on display. All of this comes from the Disney archives, who I did reach out to. They denied my request for an interview, which is very sad. Eats um, section of the exhibit. Because, you know, you're like, oh, okay, here's a panel, and then you turn a corner, and there's a new set, and they're talking about a a new theme or a new time in Disney history. So each little segment has Disney music playing overhead, but it's not overwhelming at all. Uh, There's also multiple audio and visual elements within each section where you can listen to recordings. Um, For example, there's an original recording of Oswald the Rabbit skits. There's one of Steamboat Willie, which is famously Mickey Mouse's first skit. Uh, You can listen to original music or interviews with Disney creators. And they have a lot of pieces of original technology on display, which I was blown away by. So, like, they have this one machine. Don't know what it's called. Um, I mean, I read it when I was there, of course. I just don't remember. You slide in three sets of glass, and they're on, like, trays, right? And the trays are on wheels basically and you can move them up and down so it makes and then the the camera is looking down 
through all three sheets, but that's how they did it in the early days to make it look like the camera was moving. Um, so they have that piece of technology on display. They have one of the original computers on display. It was just, it was so cool. Um, so they, they spent a lot of time talking about the different technologies that Disney has used over the years and which they've won a ton of awards for. Um, there was a segment that was all about the awards. I don't think I got a picture of it. But then when I went back to look, it was like, okay, award for best actress, best screenplay. And I was like, great. I want like use of technology here that I know they won an award for and I couldn't find it. So I guess that'll be later in the deep dive. I mentioned the rides. They have one of the spinning cups from Disneyland on display, which my grandmother and I delighted in because when I was, um, about five, may, maybe six, but I think I was still five at the time. She took me to Disneyland down, in, no, correction, correction, my apologies, took me to Disney World. So I think I said the spinning cup is from Disneyland. It's from Disney World down in Orlando, Florida. And um, we wrote on the spinning cup at that time. Um, I have the scrapbook that she put together for me of all the photos that we took while we were there. Um, but this is one that I distinctly remember outside of the photographs. I was turning that thing as hard as I could, trying to make it go faster and faster. And of course, you know, rides like these, they're programmed to only go so fast. And I was like, no, it can go faster. It can go faster. It was still too fast for my grandmother. She got a little seasick. Um, they also have one of the, this is in quotations here, cars, because it's not really a car from Peter Pan's flight. It actually kind of looks like a small version of a pirate ship. There, there's going to be a photo. But yeah, it's like a sort of like a pirate ship if it was a two-seater car and there's this sail behind you. You'll see. Um, seeing the original sheet music in person was very special to me because I had just finished processing this collection of sheet music for the Black Archives, my day job. And it just hit me all of a sudden when I saw that, that, oh, a researcher is going to find this so important someday and really appreciate this work that I did. So that was cool. That was a special little moment. Um, okay. So they had a basketball from High School Musical. That was fun. Um, one of the things that I loved the most, honestly, and I got a photo of me with it, was they have this spell book, the spell book from Hocus Pocus, which is still one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, they had Cinderella's glass slipper. <laughs> and so in the story, you know, she has tiny feet, the feet of a child, and no one else can fit the shoe because their feet are too big. In the original Grimm's version, one sister cuts off her toes and the other cuts off her heel to try and fit in the slipper. Grimm is very <laughs> grim. It's a very dark version of these fairy tale stories if you've never read the Grimm fairy tales. Um but this glass slipper was huge. I think my foot could have fit in there with room to spare. <laughs> they also had Mary Poppins' purple merry-go-round horse. That was really fun. I remember as a kid being like, yeah, I want to go ride on a magical merry-round <laughs> and then have the horses fly off. That would have been so special. I went home that night and I watched Mary Poppins. Um, they had Snow White's book, they had the Sleeping Beauty book, which was also very huge, bigger than the Snow White book. This was the book from the beginning of the movie. Um, this was, this actually might be my number one favorite part of the exhibit, is they have the book on display where you can see it and get a photo of it, and then they have a slightly smaller version where you can turn the pages, and it's like hard plastic pages, so don't worry about ripping the paper. And through Disney magic, when you turn the page, it's projected on the screen behind the book and the page turns with it. We we stood there for a good five minutes like, oh, look at that. Look at that. <laughs> it was really fun. My grandmother and I had a fabulous time. If you live in KC, if you live near KC, come to visit, go to Union Station, like I said, it opened Memorial Weekend. It's closing November 30th, so you have time, but not too much time because these few months will go fast. Tickets are on a timed arrival schedule. That way they can somewhat control traffic. But it's only $25 a piece. Honestly, I'm pretty sure that's cheaper than the normal 
uh, exhibit tickets, I feel like they're usually like $40, maybe even 50 Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm misremembering. The website says it'll take you an hour to go through this. Okay, if there's no other people around that you have to wait for them to finish reading the panel so that you can read the panel, and if you don't linger, if you just walk through like at a quick pace, maybe it'll take you an hour. I disagree. Um, we were there two, two and a half hours, and my grandmother was like, you walked really quickly, and I was like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> But I feel like we saw everything and we took it in. Uh, I think it'd be easy to spend three hours in there. I mentioned at the beginning, every room has music. I don't think it's overwhelming and loud. Um, and I do have some slight sensory issues. Like, um, if I'm in a room where there's lots of people and there's music or TV going and lots of talking, like, there's too much noise and I have trouble following conversations. I didn't have this issue here. So if you have sensory issues, I don't think that'll be a problem. There's also no strobe lights. Okay, so I don't think that there'll be a problem. But um, I also, I specifically looked online to see if they had any sensory sensitive specific days to come. Did not see that mentioned. Um, so if that's a concern, I would just recommend calling ahead, try to talk to somebody and find out for sure. There are a lot of other museums who are doing um, sensory sensitivity days, like the Nelson Atkins Art Museum of Art um, does, I think, at least one a month. Um, the, uh, what's the modern art museum that's right next to the Nelson? I want to say Casey Art Institute also has those. Um, what is it I'm thinking of? Science City does four a year. Um, spoilers, there's going to be a Battle of Westport 160th anniversary commemoration event in October. Um, not commemorating the battle itself, but commemorating camp life. And I know the owner, not the owner, sorry, I, I know the woman who's putting this on. Um, we've become, I would say, you know, pretty good friends. We're colleagues. And... I know that she is doing Friday night a sensory sensitive night, so keep an ear out for that. Where are we at? Um, I want to give a quick shout out to um, Bella Napoli in Brookside. It's where we had lunch afterwards. Cute little Italian bistro, cafe, food was delicious. Um, you know, slightly pricey, a little bit more than I intended to spend, but worth it. Um, I got the, oh, I'm blinking now. Hold on a minute. I got the, um, carbonara cause I just, I had been craving carbonara. Um, and my grandmother got the tortellini. So my carbonara was good. Don't take this the wrong way, but her tortellini was better. Oh my God. That's awesome. Mwah. All right. Um, let me see if I can think of anything else I should tell you about my adventure. Hmm. Nothing specific is coming to mind. I'll have photographs on all the social medias, so check that out. That'll be the end of today's mini so. Thank you for joining me on this adventure. Please make sure to listen to my two other recent mini sodes. One on the Miriam Urban Hike with Urban Hikes KC, and then one on Deanna Rose Children's Farmstead. If you want to support me, there are several ways you can do so. You can subscribe to patreon.com slash homegrownkc or redcircle.com slash homegrownkc. And you can also give a one-time donation at Red Circle or at coffee, that's ko-fi.com slash homegrownkc. You can give as little or as much as you want. Here's how it works if you become a patron. If you sign up, follow um, Homegrown KC, subscribe to the show, you'll be charged that day and then on the first of every following month, and if you become a patron supporter, you get three things. You get an item from the merchandise store valued at $5 or less. You get a shout out on every episode and social media posts. So thank you, Bjorn and Joan, for your continued support. And you get access to exclusive bonus content featuring other local historians, archivists, and museum curators. If you simply donate, I'll give you a shout out on the next available episode, but you won't get anything from the merchandise store and you will not get access to that bonus content. Additionally, if you sub 
um, donate to me on Coffee K O dash F I, one percent automatically goes to help fight climate change, which is something I'm very passionate about. The final way you can support me is by sending me stars on Facebook. If you cannot support me monetarily, totally understand. You can still support me by listening to the show, telling your friends about it, telling your coworkers and the people you don't like about it. Tell everybody. Um, and then like, follow, and subscribe to my social media pages. That's Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, Tumblr, and YouTube. All of my episodes are now available to listen to on YouTube as well. Homegrown KC on all of those. And then also make sure you rate and review me on Apple Podcasts. The more ratings I get, the easier it is for other folks to find me. For additional information, you can go to my website. That's homegrownkc.wordpress.com. That's also the only place you can sign up for my newsletter. Once a month, you get an email that says, Hey, here's what's new. Here's what you can expect in the coming months. In the future, I do still hope to do giveaways, but that has not happened yet. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or episode suggestions, you can email me at homegrownkcpodcast at gmail.com or send me a DM on any of my social media networks. To see what's available in my merchandise store, go to Zazzle, that's Z-A-Z-Z-L-E dot com slash store slash homegrown underscore KC underscore store. As always, a thank you goes out to my talented sister-in-law, Sarah McCombs, for the creation of my logo. To the dear missus for the use of their song Kansas City as the intro and outro music of every episode. To local libraries, which enable me to gather all my research. And thanks for listening. Cheers. seem to shake this feeling and I can seem to get you off my mind